God makes an interesting statement through the prophet Malachi. And uh, he says uh, in Malachi 3, he, said, he says to his chosen people. And by the way, they're still his chosen people. That covenant is eternal. Why do we care about, about Israel? Why do we care about God's people? By the way, it's very interesting that Israel is uh, lots of immorality in Israel. Probably number one in abortions. I don't know if you know that. You can have an abortion when you join the army. It's part of medic, medic, uh, uh, medical care, things like that. But here's an interesting thought about God. It's really a beautiful thing. God doesn't change his mind about what he's decided. So that covenant is still there. Do, 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 do what we call, refer to as Jews, need to be, still be born again? Yes. But he's speaking to his ch chosen people. And he said, you've turned from me. <laughs> this is just interesting. And he, they're like, how have we turned from you? Like, have we not prayed enough? Did we not fast enough? He goes, no, in tithes and offerings. Oh, that's interesting. That, that'll leave out. God doesn't care what you give. <laughs> See, we make up stuff to tell people to make them feel better. And unfortunately, most of them are suffering financially. So he goes, will a man rob God? He goes, he goes, why have you robbed me? He goes, in tithes and offerings. It's gotten very quiet. Some of you are very intent now. So we got your attention. He's like, you've turned away from me. He holds them. That's in the read Malachi 3. That's what he says. You've turned away from me. Like, how have we turned away from you? He goes, in tithes and offerings. Then he tells them, he goes, he goes, you are cursed with a curse. Now, I want to suggest to you that God doesn't curse anyone. He doesn't have curse to give. That's why you shouldn't curse if you're a believer. I know some of you think it's telling it like it is, but that's a demon. God doesn't curse. He doesn't have curse to give. But what he's saying there is he's, he's like, he's saying, you're robbing me. Now, notice that God takes the giving of tithes and offerings in a personal way. Who are you giving it to? Oh, no, we're giving it to new beginnings. No, no, God actually thinks you're giving it to him. So think about that every time you give. I do. I might be giving it to Global Awakening, Brother Copeland, Brother Jack, but I'm giving it to my high priest, Jesus. He said, get a picture. I get a picture of that every time. So when you're arguing about what he's asking you to do, you're actually arguing with God. Don't argue with God. He's always right. Will a man rob God? He curse with curse. Then he, then he gives a promise, you know, I'll open up the windows of heaven. But how do you rob God in your giving? It's not like if you didn't give what he asked you to do or if you didn't tithe today. And the percentage says probably maybe 25 of you 25% of you actually tithe. That's, that's not prophetic. That's actually the percentage of what we normally see. So let me help you with that one. Without consistency, it's difficult to fully receive everything God has for you in a promise. And without really believing it, then you'll never fully apprehend it. I'll get in that in a moment. So I wasn't planning on this, but it's in the room. You're robbing God. How are you robbing God? Well, here's how God thinks of it. When Abra came to the world, when the body of Christ, when new beginnings, when every person in this room came to the world, I had everything that they would ever need. I took care of it all. I took care of the mortgage payment, took care of the car payment, took care of that unexpected medical expense that they had. I got it all taken care of. A number of years ago when the Lord gave me a little understanding of that scripture, I've been meditating on it for years because I was like, will a man rob God? You gotta, you gotta think about stuff for a while with God yeah. to get it. The, the kingdom of God and the word of God was never be, meant to be understood by a casual seeker. That's why so many believers are frustrated. It's not like he's withholding it from you. He just has no obligation to reveal certain things to you that you're not interested in receiving. So, will a man, so he's got everything. He's like, 
I got it all taken care of. And, and as soon as I come into the kingdom of God, I took 100% ownership of everything. It's mine to take care of. Even if you're in a really bad place when you got born again. I'm 100% ownership of your drug addiction. I'm 100% ownership of your sick body. I got it all. And so what pleases me is if they'll trust me to receive it. And I'm a good father. So here's part of the exchange. See, when you walk with God in this area, it's really difficult to stay greedy because he's always asking for the first 10% right off the top. That's just the beginning. It's like, I don't want to get greedy. Oh, don't worry. He'll make sure if you really walk with him, you won't get greedy. He'll keep making you plan. That's part of the great process. See, everybody believes in prosperity. You just have to ask yourself, do you believe in prosperity God's way? How do we know everybody believes in prosperity? Because if I gave you a $10,000 raise or gave you a $100,000 day, most of you are like, I'll take it. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you believe in prosperity. I have never seen anyone. I fly every week. I mean, they think they're awesome. Like, I'm 2 million miles on Delta. The, the frequent flyers, they like, like this. <laughs> I've never seen anyone on Delta when they give them an upgrade. Like, no, I'm fine. I'm good. Especially on those international legs. They get beds on those. Those are nice. I just slept on those. Oh, I said, Thank you, Jesus, for beds. I flew to Africa last year. I don't remember anything. I was out. No, I really don't. Thank you, Jesus. <sighs> you know, uh, I didn't say I'm not worthy. Everybody believes in prosperity. The question is, do you believe in prosperity God's way? Everybody believes in prosperity. If I said I got $100, how many would like $100? Yeah, sure, yeah. Because it's naturally in you by God. It is. Only a devil would make up that God's people should be poor. I think about it. Sometimes unsaved people know stuff. Yeah. A doctor knows you should be well. Sometimes Christians don't know that. Think about how we've created doctrines to keep people out of that. So as a good father, what do you rob God of? You rob him of being your total source of supply in that area. God's not mad at you. You can go to heaven. You can you go to heaven and never tithe. You can go to heaven and never give an offering. But you'll never maximize him as a good father. Come on. Will a man rob God? So he brought me back to when I was, uh, I was uh, finishing undergraduate degree. It was a little while ago. <laughs> like 20 years ago. I'm getting older, but I'm not aging. <laughs> Keep that one going. Yeah. Getting older, but I'm not And I'm enjoying getting older. I am. Yeah. America's obsessed with being young. Hopefully, biblically, you, you know some stuff after you've got, you know. Hopefully, you know some stuff, you know, after you've got older. But aging doesn't make you smarter. You just might be in depends. <laughs> yeah. hopefully you're maturing time doesn't make you mature but the Lord brought me back one time when I was reading Malachi 3 I had decided to go to graduate school a few, few weeks later so I'm at graduation you know I signed up my dad comes up to me and he said hey congratulations very happy you know I had a, a partial wrestling scholarship I know you can tell I was an ex-college athlete yeah no you're wondering many of you are probably wondering that yeah yeah <laughs> That's New Jersey humor. So. <laughs> Some, in Africa, they were like, what? Is he, is he joking? Is he real? You know, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, and he said, so he said, your mom and I would like to pay for your graduate school. He said, remember that moment? You knew you were supposed to graduate school, and your earthly father had money laid up for you to do it. He goes, I got money laid up for my people in everything I call them to do. but they rob me when they don't trust me in that area. That's why faith pleases God. Why does faith please God? Because it's a joy for him to take care of you. 
it's a joy for him to be your resource. That was not in my notes either, but it's right. Lord, thanks for today. Thanks for what you want to share. Thank you for, Lord, the, the angel of uh, revelation, of wisdom and understanding that's here now. Lord, I need your help. Put your words in my mouth. And Lord, we expect and we trust that you're going to release miracles today. According to Matthew 16, God, that uh, Jesus went everywhere preaching the word with signs confirming. So I ask as I preach the word today, you would confirm it with signs following. We ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation, God. Because without revelation, we perish. May we have ears to hear and eyes to see. And uh, we'll give you praise for everything done. But let words from heaven change the earth today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share a few things here. Uh, But if you listen to uh, what Pastor Tim was saying, it resonated with me. And I have not shared this part publicly. It's it's on our website. We have what we call Word for 2024 and Beyond Uh, I don't believe that God necessarily speaks in calendar years, but he more speaks in seasons. We have a document there, some things that the Lord has given my wife and I for the last uh, probably seven, eight months for this season. But on uh, uh, November uh, the 27th and 29th, this is what the Lord said, said to me. He said, 2024 will be a year like no other. As we enter into the calendar year 2024, Truly no eye has seen nor ear has heard that which I desire in and among my people. Now is not the time to lose faith. Now is not the time to grow weary in well-doing. Now is not time to forget what I've promised. For my great desire is for 2024 to be like no other for my people. By the way, I wasn't going to share that this morning, but then I remembered that when he was saying that because I do sense that. There, I like every new year, but there was something about this new year. I was like, there's something, there's something that God is, is really wanting to get to his people in this season. Yet you must stay in the rhythm of the purposes of God. You must not become distracted. You must not look to the world system to determine how to act at this crucial season in the history of the world. Be vigilant to obey. Be vigilant to, be, uh, excuse me, be vigilant to fully draw near to me. Be vigilant to stay offense free, and you will be you you will begin to experience a season like no other. For this generation of people on the earth will be a people who dream like Joseph, and in the middle of famine display my exploits in every area of their life. Yeah, give him praise for that. Then there's another uh, space that the Lord pointed me out to before the beginning of the year, and it was from December the 22nd, and that's a part I want to zero in for at least the next hour or so. So I'm glad you didn't laugh. Some people get nervous. (laughs) And this is what he told me on December December the 22nd. My greatest passion is for people in the earth who are truly progressively coming to know me, who know my ways, who know my heart, who know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. This is a season of distinct change and turning. I'm releasing heavenly blueprints to my people, and this is the part that just so jumped out to me, to live with the purpose of Joseph, have a heart of worship of David, have the excellence of Daniel, and know how to build like Nehemiah. At the center of what I'm doing in the earth is a people whose greatest desire is to know me. A people who have come to know the pleasure of experiencing my beauty and presence as a lifestyle. So I invite my people to know, uh, to know me. For many of my children have secondary understanding of my ways in the earth. I'm inviting my people to know me, to experience me, and walk with me all the days of their life in the earth. This is my greatest desire that my people would know me. What did he tell us too through the prophet Hosea? My people are destroyed. Not because of the devil. Not because of demons. Not because of any trauma that's happened to them. All can stop you, but they're destroyed for a lack of what? Revelation knowledge. 
And I want to go back to this moment here, and I think God was emphasizing, I wasn't planning on going to that Malachi 3 thing, but it's vitally important that you become fully convinced in the things not only that God has said in his word, but God has said to you personally as a rhema word, whether it be prophetically, whether it's in you know, your time of fellowship with him, it's really, 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 really important that you fully agree. Because unless you fully agree, unless you fully embrace, and it's, it can be a beautiful process too, of wrestling with, and I say wrestling, I don't know if I know a better term, but really uh, finding out why you can't receive something that God said to you. And I, I was thinking about this, was going into our uh, New Year's event this year, I had felt like the Lord asked me to say something about uh, my journey and him telling me I'm a prophet and these different things. And I realized that over the years, that a number of occasions, the Lord had told me certain things about this area of my assignment. And I call it my assignment because uh, assignment is part of your personality and identity, but it doesn't define you. And personhood never precedes a person's ministry calling. You, you'll, never, you'll never see a phrase in scripture, uh, the apostle Paul. You always, you always say, Paul the apostle. So God establishes the person before he wants to establish the strength of the ministry call. So he says in there, he says, uh, he, 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 I realized that he, the, part of the reason he was saying something to me over and over again through the years about being a prophet was because I wasn't fully, appre I wasn't fully agreeing with it. I wasn't fully wrapping my heart around it. And until I wrapped my heart around it, I didn't begin to maximize that grace in my life. So where you fully fail to fully agree with the Lord, you won't grab the whole nutrients of that word for your life. Another one I had to wrestle with is uh, the, con the concept of being wealthy. God began to tell me a number of years, I'm going to do certain things for you. Funny. It, just, it, it was like a little, and it's a healing process because it, Psalms uh, 23 says, he's a good shepherd who restores your soul. The Septuagint is he restores it once, but it's a continual restore. So when God challenges you with things in his word, he's often trying to deliver you of things and experiences that you had that are actually contrary to that. God's word has always been intended for your life to be the highest form of reality. And so within that word, it carries the context to heal every part of you that was broken. And every one of us have experienced brokenness because Adam made this choice. So people are like, are you saying, you know, uh, my parents' choice has affected me? Yes. Yes, I am. Because you are made in the image of God and you're also made in the image of your parents because your parents were created to represent God in your life. So where there's a deficit there, there's a restoring power that God wants to do there. But you can't restore something you won't recognize needs fixing. So you can, you can declare victory in an area, but if you have not applied the word of God and restored that thinking, that brokenness there, then you will still live with the fragments of brokenness. Has God made you free? Absolutely. You have to apply the work to that area. So the challenge is, though, you can be walking with the Lord, talk in tongues, see some fruit, but still have areas of brokenness. Not you, the person behind you, Linda. <laughs> so often, if we've been around the things of the Lord sometimes, we have... We have added the Lord and we have had that dysfunction so long. What, what we think is normal is actually bondage, bondage to relationships, bondage to ideas. We, we can identify often the big quote unquote addictions, but it's often the subtle places because in your, in your life, God also wants to reset generations. People are like, how, how, how can it be my family affected me? How can it be that Adam affected us 5,000 years ago? We're all a result of that. It's like, people have such trouble with that. Like, yes, yes, we've all had an injustice done to us because of what Adam did. 
but we've all had justice done to us for what Jesus did. So I don't know how I got on that. So God's goal for you is to be like Jesus. Amen. God's goal is not to get you to heaven. If your vision is not that, then you'll be deficient in seeing and walking with God correctly. It, it, it's a very, very low denominator to just, I just want to get to heaven. In fact, if that's your mindset, you might not get there. Because in heaven, it's only, it's only open to obedient people. So God's vision for every believer is to be like Jesus. For those he for uh, this is Romans 8, apostolic teaching. For those he for on you, he also predestined, what? To be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. So Jesus is prophet, priest, king, God, but also our elder brother, also the one who reestablished the human race because he was the second Adam. So God's goal is for you to be like him. And those who he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. That's good news. God's been lied about. It's good news for you. You don't have to live that way. He's, got a, he's the originator of, uh, he's, origi he's the original psychologist. He's the original doctor. He's the original counselor. He's got it all in the kingdom of God. He restores every part, broken emotions, ideas, concepts. So in the Old Testament, we have this concept called types and shadows. Paul said, again, apostolic teaching, Colossians 2, or in respect of a holy day or a new moon or a Sabbath, these are shadows to things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So we have certain people that we refer to as types and shadows of Jesus. 1 Samuel 3, uh, there's this prophecy of uh, th that God will raise up a faithful priest who will do all that is in the heart and the mind of God. It's interesting. Most people think the true fulfillment is Jesus, but the practical fulfillment of that was uh, 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 Samuel there in that chapter. So you have a type in Samuel and the full fulfillment in Jesus. Yeah. Get it? Yeah. Joseph, excuse me, David is one of those. Jesus is called the son of David. Now, this is why, this is why I, I backdrop that with uh, Jesus is the example. Because David's got some characteristics that we want to follow as New Testament people. You don't want to follow his, his example of, uh, of uh, adultery. <laughs> but he's got some New Testament characteristics. But in fact, in the book of Acts, what we refer to as the Jerusalem Council, it says that uh, in the last days... God is going to what? Rebuild the tabernacle of David, right? If he's going to rebuild the tabernacle of David, he's going to need New Testament people like David. So David is a type and shadow of Jesus. 58 New Testament references, and Jesus is called the son of David. Really interesting. Uh, the Bible is interesting. If you're bored reading the Bible, get born again today, please. Yeah. <laughs> You know, people, their whole ministry, their whole ministry, their whole lives was spent on interpreting scripture into common languages. That's what they spent their whole life doing. <laughs> like, I don't know, at least 12 translations on that iPad. Most people figure out some things when they start reading scripture. <laughs> What's your problem? You know, <laughs> please read your scripture. Luther changed, literally, this is no exaggeration, he literally changed the world with half a verse. He didn't get some other things right, but at least we thank God for that. You know, the just shall live by faith. He, he could not figure out how he could, how, how God could actually like him. And he figured out, it's not anything I've done. The just shall live by faith. Also, but Jesus called the son of David and he's going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem no matter what you think of end times or uh, what's going to happen in the end times. I don't think anyone's quite got it right. It's just my personal conviction. Jesus, Jesus told some plain things to his disciples and they got it wrong. So <laughs> get confused sometimes with the charts and stuff. But all I know is 
Love Jesus with all your heart. Do business till he comes and live in victory. But Jesus is going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem, not Washington, D.C., and it's called not the throne of Jesus, but the throne of David. I don't understand all that one. Except this. Jesus and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are okay identifying with weak people. Right? So Jesus, David is the man after God's own heart. He's a type and shadow of Jesus. And the prophetic word there was a heart of worship like David. Heart of worship like David. And I want to say some things. I think that will give a good backdrop. And I've already said one of these. To look a little bit about David over the next few moments. We know this, that God's nature towards humanity never uh, remains unrelenting regardless of behavior. So, you could be making lots of poor choices. Not you, Linda, the person behind you. (laughs) And God still goes, I've loved you with an everlasting love. That's why people are like, "Didn't, didn't the Jews reject Jesus? Yeah, a lot of the churches rejected Jesus, but he doesn't change his choice. Now, just because, though, he's got this unrelenting love for people, it doesn't mean he suspends his word or another attribute of him that he's a righteous judge. So when everyone stands before him, he can, he can love you unapologetically, but he will, he will hold you responsible as a righteous judge for the choices you make on the earth. There's no contradiction. That's why, anyway... The world often just makes stuff about God. How can a loving God let people suffer? Like He's got nothing to do with it. He's made provision so they don't have to suffer. The world suffers when people make bad choices. The world suffers when there's evil people and governing authority. Because there's God, angels, cherubim. There's also devil, demons. Holy Spirit needs people to operate in the earth. So do demons. This season, I will bring a birthing, a manifestation of prophetic words from long ago. It will be a renaissance move of my spirit in the United States. It will be a move of my spirit that will be characterized by the power of God, the glory of God, and a revelation of my son. Focus, steadfastness, and perseverance are essential to navigate the coming season. Do not lose heart. Great will be my people's fruit and reward in this season.